Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Pancho had a dream that he was drowning, as if cold hands tightly gripped his legs, pulling him deeper underwater. A scream of horror welled up in his chest. What if this was the end? Can life end so quickly and absurdly? All you manage to do is be born, start a business, lose it, and nothing more. You don't have a beloved woman by your side. Your mother is going to be left all alone. Lord, help. And then he felt another force, warm, bright, penetrating underwater, illuminating everything, and the cold hands suddenly disappeared. Slowly, he began to rise, whispering for some reason. Dad, Dad. Pancho abruptly sat up in bed, shaking his shoulders to shake off the remnants of sleep. This dream had visited him repeatedly in the past few months. For the first time, he had it in November. A month later, his business partner took over everything, leaving Pancho with nothing. The web design business was lucrative, but Pancho couldn't manage everything on his own, so he brought in a former classmate as a partner. The classmate suggested adding an advertising branch, and Pancho agreed. Then, the partner proposed bringing in his own accountant and lawyer to ensure everything was legal and proper. Pancho agreed to that too, even though his neighbor Pablo Alvarez handled his accounting and was someone he could trust. It was Pablo who hinted that his partner might take over the business, but Pancho didn't believe it. The classmate was an experienced businessman, and it seemed like he would just help create a successful company. Then, one fine day, Pancho was simply barred from entering his own company. The partner refused to speak to him. They only packed a couple of boxes with his belongings from the office. It turned out that the partner, using Pancho's electronic signature, transferred the company into his full ownership and did the same with the bank accounts. Pancho was left with almost no funds, except what he had managed to put into brokerage accounts. For the first couple of months, Pancho tried to fight back. He hired a lawyer, prepared a lawsuit, and then found out that the lawyer had been bribed by his ex-partner. The lawyer, while helping Pancho, passed all the information to the other side, misleading Pancho. In the last meeting with the lawyer, he handed Pancho a letter from the ex-partner that said, Listen, you are not a businessman. You do great websites, but you can't run a company. Think about it, now you have no business, no money, but you came out without losses. In the last two months, you spent 400000 on a lawyer. I guarantee no lawyer will be on your side. I suggest a settlement. I pay you your 400000 and you stop trying to get the business back. I don't want to cause you any more trouble, buddy. Pancho had been reading and rereading this text for a whole day. If only he had known what his classmate was capable of. And how right Pablo was when he hinted at the possible outcome. Now this partner was making a grand gesture, reimbursing Pancho for the money spent on the bribed lawyer. However, the partner was right, Pancho left without money and without losses. Thanks to Pablo, his financial affairs were in order. But he was left without a business, and it was the midst of peak season, so he needed money badly. After thinking a bit more, he accepted the partner's offer, and he returned the money to him. Pancho had been feeling strange, celebrating the new year without having a job. Pancho couldn't muster the courage to tell his mother that his business had come to an end. He felt that his own helplessness and carelessness had let him down. On New Year's Eve, she was sitting across from him at the table, looking so graceful and beautiful. The lights of the Christmas garland reflected on her well-groomed and hard-working hands. She suspected nothing. He remembered how he had always been proud of his beautiful mother and resented his father, whom he had never even seen in photos. How could he leave such a woman? Was he really such a fool? She had to raise their son alone, lose sleep when he was sick, scrape together money when he went to school, and take the first courses of college. Suddenly, the guy realized that he had never thought about himself, about growing up without father's attention and love. He felt sorry for his mother, who had been working at two places while he was growing up. She rarely went to the sanatorium and miraculously preserved her beauty. On New Year's Eve, as the clock struck midnight, he decided to make a wish for the first time. 
With his small, neat handwriting, he wrote on a piece of paper, Mom is not alone. I have a family. I start a business, and I invite Pablo to join. Then, as tradition dictated, he burned the note and drank the ashes with champagne. His mother looked at him in astonishment, and he, looking serious, said, Mom, everything will be fine. Just believe in me. I do, his mother quietly replied, and Pancho saw reflections of Christmas ornaments gleaming in her eyes. Shortly after the new year, Pancho visited Pablo and shared his sad story. Pablo was listening attentively, nodding knowingly, and whistling at the dramatic parts. When he heard the story about the lawyer, he even cursed. Forgive me, Pancho, but your so-called partner is a real scoundrel. I can't find decent words for him. And I don't even know why I didn't like him from the start. But sometimes, from a distance, you just sense what kind of person someone is. What a jerk. How could he do that? Bribing someone and then returning the money himself. Pancho shrugged. He could never have expected such behavior from a guy he once studied with. I could, of course, play the role of the older brother and give you some advice, Pablo continued. But what's the use? You give him an inch and he'll take an L. It's good that you're still alive, if you know what I mean. Pancho had never considered such an outcome, but Pablo's hint sent a chill down his spine. But, of course, we won't dwell on such trash, right, Pancho? Pablo said, throwing his hands behind his head. What are you planning to do next? Start everything anew, Pancho confidently replied. All right. Pablo nodded approvingly. I guess you want me back as your accountant? I do, Pablo, Pancho replied. But not only as an accountant. What do you mean? I don't know how to make websites. As a partner, I will sell websites to companies along with accounting support. There are plenty of companies like mine right now. They seem to have a business and pay taxes, but they don't hire a professional accountant. Yes, I'm a top class professional. Pablo nodded contentedly. Look, I recently upgraded my qualification. He pointed to a new certificate on the wall. Seems like I should raise my rates already. After all, I'm so smart, as my mom would say. Pablo's mother, Gabriela, mostly lived in the countryside, only occasionally visiting her son. Most of the time, Pablo himself went to her, planting vegetables in the spring, harvesting in the summer, and harvesting in the fall. And, of course, he never missed a New Year, International Women's Day, or birthday. Well, Pancho, I accept your proposal. I can recommend your services to my clients. I know that some of them would like a new landing page, or whatever it's called. Pancho nodded with a smile. But we need to do things seriously and responsibly, that's for sure. So we will definitely sign a contract, he said in a sing-song tone. We'll sign everything, and everyone will be happy. Pancho left Pablo in a cheerful mood, but at the doorway, Pablo decided to share another of his premonitions. And I also have a feeling, Pancho, that big changes are coming your way, and he squinted slyly. What do you mean? After the hint about the hand, Pancho was ready for the worst. In a good way. Why have you tensed up? Pablo laughed. I don't mean anything bad. I think you'll meet a girl soon. Is it written somewhere in my destiny? Pancho inquired with irony. Probably, if I read it, Pablo retorted. Sometimes you look at a person and roughly imagine what their future will be like. The same happened with your partner. I didn't even see him, but I immediately understood what he was about to do. And with you, I don't know how to say it, but it feels like you're open to relationships. You've become more serious and determined. So, everything will be fine. Oh, Pablo. Sighed Pancho. I do want a girlfriend, but where do I find her? I have to take care of her, but I have a mortgage. It's probably not possible right now. Well, most importantly, don't tell the girl about your difficulties, Pablo said in the tone of an older friend. Everyone has problems in life. She would probably prefer having a mortgage. He winked. 
A few nights after that conversation, Pancho had another dream in which he was sinking. This time, he was desperately struggling, and from under the water, he heard a mocking laughter echoing towards him. Strong male hands lifted him up again, and he heard, as if from a distance, his own childlike voice screaming. Dad. Daddy. Another month passed. It was mid-February, and Pancho was returning home from a client meeting. The client received a website from Pancho and accounting assistance from Pablo, and Pancho was smiling confidently as he was driving his Volkswagen. He was indeed lucky, as his mother always said. Many things came easily to him, school, college. And even here, if he agreed with Pablo, he practically came out unscathed. But then he became serious because he remembered his New Year's wishes. Was he right to write all that? His mother was not alone. But could he decide on this issue? He had never seen his father in his dreams and could only assume, comparing his photos with his mother's, that he had the same high forehead, generous lips, and large nose his father did. All attempts to talk to his mother on this subject were cut short. Pancho understood long ago that, despite all her love for her son, she still harbored resentment towards his father. Or maybe she still loved him. Nobody can tell what is going on in another person's mind. Pancho sighed, sitting in the car at a traffic light. Perhaps it was an improper wish, even though he really wanted his mother to be happy as a woman. He heard from her few friends that feminine happiness gives the strength to live. And although she was 56, she still needed this strength. Arriving in the neighborhood and parking his car in the garage, Pancho slowly walked towards his home. It was a sunny February day, the sky was transparently blue, and almost spring freshness splashed in it. A light breeze pleasantly caressed his face. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a small female figure in a shapeless, long, dark coat on the children's playground. He thought it might be someone's mother waiting for a child from school. He bought his two-bedroom apartment on the second floor of a new building when the previous business brought in a high income. It didn't go without a mortgage, so now Pancho counted his money carefully to make the payments. The atmosphere was very bachelor-like. In the living room, there was a sofa, a carpet on the floor, a coffee table, and a TV on the wall. In the bedroom, there were a large bed and a wardrobe with mirrored doors. In the kitchen, there were a set, a round table, and three chairs. The table and chairs were sold as a set in a furniture store, and Pancho bought them, even though only his mother and a couple of friends came to visit. But never more than two gathered at the table. He rarely invited anyone to the kitchen and rarely cooked. Left without a business, he suddenly realized how much time he dedicated to work. At the same time, he rarely engaged in sports, almost did not cook, and relied on ready-made meals. He was lucky even here, if you can put it that way. With the onset of the pandemic, many places opened up where they cooked quite familiar and very healthy food. And Pancho, for the first time in ages, stopped eating just sandwiches, omelets, and pizza. Of course, he missed his mother's pancakes, fritters, and cheesecakes. But, having decided at the age of 22, after finishing college, to live separately, he did not deviate from his decision. Now he was almost 35, standing by the window of his own apartment, looking at the street where the same female figure in a coat was sitting on the swings and shivering. She doesn't look like someone's mother, Pancho thought. It occurred to him that she must be a homeless woman. For a moment, he felt sorry for her. How old could she be? Maybe she was the same age as his mother? His mother lived in the adjacent neighborhood, and it would take a half hour for Pancho to get there on foot. This woman was passing the time on the playground, and it seemed like she had nowhere to go. For lunch, Pancho was waiting for a delivery, two salads, Olivier and Caesar, chicken legs with mashed potatoes, and a cream cake for evening coffee. He went to the living room, turned on the TV, and briefly watched the news before the feeling of having completed work and the warmth of the apartment lulled him. He was awakened by the chirping of the doorbell, received the order, and had already started unpacking the packages in the kitchen when outraged cries and a woman's crying reached him from the street. 
He turned to the window and saw three women from his building chatting in their language mixed with English, surrounding that very woman on the swings. The woman covered her face with her hands and, as one could guess, was crying. The thought that she might be the same age as his mother literally burned Pancho. And without putting on a jacket and just a sweater, he ran to the yard. What's the matter, ladies? Pancho shouted sternly. It turned out the female assaulter was already ready to call the police, but upon hearing a male voice, the women turned around, and Marina from the fourth floor, one of them, indignantly reported. This woman has been living here for three days. Oh, come on. Pancho was surprised. I only saw her today. She leaves during the day, and in the evening, she comes back and sleeps in that children's house over there. Marina pointed to the wooden playhouse on the playground. And children play in that house later, holding onto the doors and windows. And there's so much dirt there. The other two women, Teresa from the neighboring entrance and Marina's silent acquaintance, looked at the woman with undisguised contempt. Now Pancho could see that she was not at all the same age as his mother. She was indeed in dirty clothes and long, unwashed shoes. It was clear that she herself hadn't washed for a long time, but she didn't look like a typical street dweller. And most importantly, at first glance, she was barely the same age as Pancho himself. Let's call the police already. Marina continued. Let them take her somewhere else. She has no right to spread dirt here. No need to call the police, the girl cried. Pancho felt sorry for her. Wait, ladies. We can always call the police later. How did you end up on the street? He asked the girl. How did you think she did? Don't behave as if you don't know. Teresa suddenly joined the conversation. Probably her partner kicked her out. Now she's wandering around. Pancho waved her away. Teresa, if your husband kicks you out, should we also report you to the police? You should have brought her a piece of bread since she's been here for three days. What happened, young lady? The girl, who had endured so much humiliation before, burst into tears as she now, out of nowhere, had a defender. Everyone was standing in bewilderment when suddenly Pablo's melodious voice echoed from a distance. Pancho's neighbor was coming to the swings with a thermos, a steamed bottle of mineral water with a brown beverage, and a foil-wrapped bundle. He was smiling, as always, but it was evident that he was not pleased with what was happening. Look, comrades, you organized a rally, but you didn't think about food and hot drinks. Off to the field kitchen. The bewildered ladies and Pancho parted, and Pablo approached the swings. Look, I brought you coffee, specially poured it into a bottle, added sugar, and made two sandwiches, one with sausage, the other with cheese. Have a drink, dear, help yourself. No need to cry, but you'll have to tell us what happened after all. We might need to call the police. You are the victim, right? He was waiting until the girl nodded frantically, eagerly swallowing the hot coffee, and continued. I was balancing the accounts for a client when suddenly I heard all this commotion. Ladies, it's as if you didn't live through the 90s and never had problems yourselves. Especially you, Teresa. Instead of asking the girl about her situation, you immediately started talking about police, cohabitants, bums. Shame on you, ladies. Marina tried to bring up the topic of dirt and children again, but Pablo cut her off. Marina, in my childhood in the 70s, we climbed trees, scraped our knees, drank water from street fountains, and nobody thought about dirt. We create so much moral filth, but clean only the streets. Don't worry, everything will be fine with your children. Meanwhile, the girl had eaten both sandwiches and was warming her hands on a new portion of coffee in the bottle, which Pablo had carefully poured from the thermos. She was still sitting on the swings. Her ridden hands gradually paled from the warmth. She did not lift her eyes and gazed at the snow whitening under her feet. Well, lovely creature, Pablo continued. Tell us about yourself and let us know how we can help you. I'm Lorenza, the girl replied. I did leave my husband, that's true. Now, I'm trying to find any kind of work here. But when I came here from another city, I still had some money. 
I rented a room in a dormitory and started going for interviews. Then, two weeks ago, I came back to the dormitory at night and my things and documents were stolen. I went to the police and filed a report, but she started crying again. That's how I ended up on the street. Marina, who had maintained a stern expression until this moment, was now ready to cry herself. Oh, poor thing. How can you live without documents? What a horror. Do you have any relatives here? Teresa asked. I don't have anyone. My parents died, and I'm an orphan. My husband drank and gambled. When it became unbearable, I left him. A silence fell. Everyone was contemplating what to do and how to help. But then Pancho decisively spoke up. All right, Lorenza, I have lunch and a separate room at my place. You'll come with me now, have lunch, warm up, rest, and tomorrow we'll decide what to do. He noticed Pablo looking at him with a slight surprise. However, the offer had been made, and under the current circumstances, she couldn't refuse it. But Lorenza didn't rush to get off the swings. I have no money, she said. I don't care about your money, Pancho replied. You might freeze out here at night. Girl, do what this young man tells you. The third woman finally joined the conversation. We all know him. He's very decent. He won't harm you, and once you find a job, you can go wherever you want. Marina and Teresa, more amicably this time, were ready to forcibly lift the girl from the swings to take her home with Pancho. But Lorenza got up by herself, thanked Pablo for the coffee and sandwiches, and followed Pancho. At Pancho's home, he immediately told the girl to have a shower, and he stuffed her old clothes into a large cellophane bag for disposal. While she was in the shower, he reheated lunch and remembered that he had no women's clothing, not even underwear. With his ex-girlfriend, they lived at her place, and he had always lived alone in this apartment. For a moment, he was flustered, but then he heard a knock from the bathroom. He approached the door and heard, Sorry, I have nothing to wear. Yes, I know. I'll figure something out right away. He rushed into the bedroom and took out his sports pants, a belt, and a sweatshirt. Here, take these. Use the belt to tighten the pants and put the sweatshirt on top. As for me, well, let's eat first. When you're dressed, come to the kitchen. To avoid embarrassing the girl, Pancho left and sat at the table. He didn't rush to eat, waiting for Lorenza to come out of the bathroom. When she entered the kitchen, she sat across from him, and he saw her beautiful green eyes, shoulder-length brown hair, a straight nose with tiny freckles, and plump lips that had cracked from the cold. She's a beautiful girl, Pancho thought to himself. He gave her most of the food and poured more coffee. She warmed up gradually and even smiled a little, although tears were still welling up in her eyes, he could see that. When they finished the lunch, she thanked him and said, You know, I thought it would all end like this. It was so cold last night. That woman lied. I didn't sleep at all yesterday. I was just walking around the neighborhood. Standing here for a while, then there, I was afraid to freeze. It was very cold. Now everything will be fine, Pancho smiled. We'll find you a job, and things will get better. What skills do you have? I worked as a teacher in my hometown, but they paid poorly, understandably so. And my husband took everything and gambled online. I tried to reason with him, but he would beat me. He drank heavily, whether he won or lost. And he beat me severely. I was afraid he would damage my face, otherwise, how would I meet the children? Then, one day, he got really angry and split my lip. I went to school the next day. And, of course, the principal called me in and said, you can't work in such a condition. I told her, what about the students? How am I supposed to live? And the principal replied, am I going to tell the parents? That your husband beats you? You've set a bad example. Here, Lorenza's voice broke and she cried again. Pancho took her hand. After a while, she continued. I lost my job. I had to quit. There is nowhere to go and no one to turn to. There are no relatives. At night, when my husband was asleep, I packed a few things I had and fled to the station. 
I arrived in the city with the first train and found a dormitory. They accepted me, and the rest, you know, she cried again. Where did you try to find work? Pancho asked sympathetically. Oh, everywhere. Lorenza sobbed. I started with my profession, but here, without the internet, it's challenging. You think you're going to the right school by following the district signs, but, in reality, it's a kindergarten or high school. I do shop classes for children, that's elementary school. I went to different places, but there are no vacancies. Once I entered a leisure center, they asked for various certificates. I don't have them yet. I said, let me start working, pay me in advance, and I'll go get all the certificates. But they refused, saying they couldn't do it. Then my documents were stolen. I had been walking around like a zombie for a day, thinking where to go and how to restore them. I filed a report with the police, but my phone ran out of charge. I don't know what happened after that. I went everywhere, thinking I could work as a janitor, a sweeper, or a dishwasher just to earn enough to rent a corner, but again, nothing. And now, I sleep in underpasses. My clothes are dirty, I can't wash them, I can't bathe, and everyone looks at me as if I'm a homeless person. Pancho tried, as advised by Pablo, not to succumb to the narrative, but in his heart and soul, he was growing convinced that the girl was telling the truth. He feverishly considered various options. Lorenza, have you ever done website design? Judging by her eyes widening in surprise, he understood that this was something entirely unfamiliar to her. I see, you haven't. But I'll learn. She quickly replied. I learned to work in Photoshop quickly once. That's understandable. But if you knew, I would have given you a job already. He noticed desperation in her eyes and hurried to explain himself. Without documents, no one will hire you, that's clear. While the documents are being processed, I suggest you stay at my place. Intercepting her readiness to refuse, he cautioned. Without money, you have nowhere to live, and I'll pay you, but not a lot. I have to pay for a mortgage. Let's do this. You take care of the house, use the washing machine, and cook, and I'll pay you for that. You'll live in a large room. Once we restore your documents, you will find a job and an apartment. Or not, he thought to himself. He had taken a liking to her green, kind eyes. They went shopping for new clothes the next day. Pancho woke up early, thinking of making breakfast. But lying in bed, he was surprised to catch the appetizing aroma of pancakes. He went to the kitchen and saw Lorenza standing at the stove. Good morning. Decided to start my duties right away. She announced with a smile. You're quick. Pancho smiled back. Thought you'd want to sleep in. I'll nap during the day, she said, placing a plate of pancakes. Then they went to the nearest shopping center. Pancho wasn't used to buying women's clothes. His mom went shopping with friends, and his ex-girlfriend ordered everything online. He felt that Lorenzo was hesitant to choose, clearly not wanting to involve him in significant expenses. So, he asked matter-of-factly, What's your clothing size? 48. Okay, and shoes? Six. All right, here's the plan. We'll go in and ask them to show us items in those sizes. You'll try on what you like, and we'll buy it. But what if it's expensive? Lorenzo whispered. We'll figure it out on the spot, Pancho replied. Three hours later, Lorenzo had two dresses, two pairs of jeans, two sweaters, and three shirts. She also got a new coat hat, scarf with gloves, a pair of boots, comfortable shoes, and a new bag. However, she felt awkward about going lingerie shopping with Pancho. Lorenza, go and choose on your own. Ask them to wrap everything at the checkout, and I'll come in and pay, he suggested. That's exactly what they did. Later, they bought pizza and headed home. During dinner, Lorenza, grateful for his help, said, you know, it's awkward to admit, but no one has ever bought me clothes before. My parents died when I was still in school, my grandma raised me until college, and then she passed away. 
My husband only gave flowers while courting, but later, he started taking the money. I could only buy something new on payday after my lessons. I feel really uncomfortable, but once my documents are restored and I find a job, I'll pay you back. Lorenza. Pancho grinned. You don't have to pay me back for anything. I'll earn the money. I'll make three websites, and the money will come back to me on its own. Well, it's the first time I bought clothes for a girl. My ex used to get everything online, and my mom handled it without me. But here, it's a different story. Anyway, I'm glad you're now dressed and shod. Lorenza impulsively and firmly hugged him, and in response, he, caught up in the moment, hugged her back. But they quickly pulled away. Both blushed, and he said, Wear them with pleasure. Thank you, she replied softly. Over the next two months, Pancho got to know Lorenza better. It turned out she was an excellent cook and knew how to sew. It was indeed clean at the house, which Pancho had never been able to achieve on his own. She could sing well too, and Pancho, for the first time in years, dusted off his guitar and started playing some evenings. During one such impromptu concert, Pablo paid them a visit. He also liked to sing, even if he didn't always hit the right notes. But Lorenzo was more inclined to favor her other savior. When she went to the kitchen to prepare dinner after a few songs, Pablo leaned in conspiratorially and said, I think she likes you. Pancho blushed a little. Is it that obvious? Well, of course. There are special signs, how a person looks at us, how they sit in relation to us. Look, she's looking at you with tenderness, that's a very good sign. And what should I do then? Pancho asked. I can't just ask her to start sleeping in the same room. I need to somehow lead up to it. Well, that's easier than you think. Invite her somewhere, to the theater or the movies, something you both like. Communicate, Pablo laughed. By the way, what about her documents? They haven't found anything yet, but they're making inquiries and restoring them. Once they're restored, she'll start looking for a job and file for divorce. Such wonderful news, exclaimed Pablo. By that time, you must absolutely, so to speak, lead both of you into a relationship. Pancho listened to the advice and soon invited Lorenza to the theater. She wore one of the dresses and high-heeled boots, and she styled her hair. She was shorter than him, and he enjoyed feeling like her protector. After the play, he invited her to a restaurant. They sat there for a long time, and gathering his courage, he said, Lorenza, I've decided that I want. He couldn't think of what to say next. So, closing his eyes, he blurted out in a half whisper, To date you. I really like you. He opened his eyes and saw her embarrassed face, a blush on her cheeks, and tears in her eyes. I agree, she whispered. I really like you too. But I'm not used to talking about feelings myself. I decided that it's up to you to say yes or no. If it's a no, I'll leave as soon as I get my documents back. You're not going anywhere, Pancho said, squeezing her hand tightly. Surprisingly, after the explanation, Pancho's business started to flourish. He had even more clients, and he couldn't handle the influx of orders. Lorenza reminded him that she was willing to learn how to create websites. After thinking for some time, he delegated her tasks related to content creation. Her texts were well written, and with Pablo, they increasingly covered small businesses and self-employed individuals. Look, Pancho, the accountant said during one meeting. Soon, you'll be competing with your former company. And he smiled with satisfaction. We might need to find a roof to hide under so they won't come up with something else. You know, Pablo, Pancho confessed, I had kind of forgotten about them. But justice needs to be served. There's God for it, Pancho, and the ways of the Lord are inscrutable. They say, wish your enemies well. And up there, they know what to give them. You're right, Pancho nodded. That's why I want to travel to different regions. I'm sure they are working with my clients, but we need to attract new ones. So, I'm going. 
I've already found a few companies, sent them a commercial proposal, and they are interested. I'll live in that place for a week and see what people do there. I'll visit nearby suburbs. When I return, I'll look for another webmaster to join the team, and from there, we can expand to other regions. Well done. Pablo nodded approvingly, dreamily closing his eyes. I can already see it. Your company will become even bigger, and I'll get an assistant too. And then, in about three years, I'll stop counting those balances, and I'll have my own office. Boys and girls will handle everything in the program, and I'll relax at the country house. Beautiful picture. Pancho exclaimed. You've made me even more enthusiastic. Well, you know, a rolling stone gathers no moss, Pablo shrugged. When are you leaving? Tomorrow. I'll go home now. The woman is waiting for me, Pancho mumbled for some reason. Well, a man always wants to come home if there's a good woman there, Pablo confirmed with a nod. At home, during dinner, Pancho told Lorenza that he was leaving. I'm leaving the keys with you, of course, there's money. If you need anything, write in the messenger and I'll transfer it. Just don't be gone for too long, the girl smiled. I'll miss you. I'll fly back at the speed of the wind when I finish my business. Pancho replied. That night, his nightmare repeated. This time, Pancho was surprised to see the face of the person trying to drag him underwater. It was a young woman's face, framed by long strands of black hair. Pancho felt like he knew this woman, but he couldn't remember who she was. And this plunged him into greater horror than the depths of the sea. He screamed, waking up, and sat up abruptly. Lorenza also woke up and touched his hand. Pancho, what's wrong? Did you have a bad dream? Yeah, some damn thing has been haunting me since November. It's like I'm drowning, or more precisely, someone is drowning me. They pull me down by the legs to the bottom, and I understand it, trying to resist somehow. And suddenly some strong male hands lifted me up, like saving me. And it all ends. Today, I dreamt that some girl with black hair was pulling me underwater. I've never seen her in my life, but in the dream, it felt like I knew her. And that scared me. Are you sure you don't know her? Lorenza clarified. Pancho understood what she meant and replied. Absolutely sure. My ex was a blonde. Strange, maybe it's not even about you in the dream. What do you mean, not about me? I read somewhere, Lorenza began slowly, as if recalling what she had read, that sometimes a person can receive information about other people, specifically in a dream. But usually, it's about someone close to them. Wow, Pancho frowned. That's interesting. When those male hands pulled me out, I kind of heard the word dad or daddy. It seemed like it was my voice and not mine. But I've never seen my father in my life, and my mother doesn't talk about him. In short, is he alive? It's all strange, Pancho, said Lorenza, stroking his hand. Let's go to sleep, he replied, lying down and pulling Lorenza along. We need to get up in three hours. Pancho left for eight days. The first three days after his departure dragged unbearably slowly. Since there was no need to cook much, Lorenza handled all household chores quickly. She completed all the necessary work, and by the fifth day, she found herself with literally nothing to do. Pancho hadn't introduced her to his mother yet. So, for the remaining three days until Pancho's return, Lorenzo was completely alone. Meanwhile, April had arrived, and the snow had almost melted, revealing the still chilly ground with the first delicate shoots breaking through. Rain was infrequent, but despite its absence, every corner of the glazed sky was filled with purity and lightness. The weather promised to be good, and Lorenza decided to go to the city, as she didn't know it at all. The city center seemed incredible to her, a girl from a distant small town. Small, two-story houses from the 19th century were standing side by side with 20th century buildings, over which modern skyscrapers of glass and concrete were rising. There were bright signs, incredible shop windows, and the enchanting aroma of coffee. 
On one of the streets, Lorenza stopped, looked around, examining magnificent facades and elegant cars, and burst into tears. She could never have seen any of this. She would have lived with her husband, giving him all the money. She would have lost her job, and what would have happened to her? On the other hand, she still had nothing here. She got a job, a roof over her head, and money thanks to Pancho. And although she was grateful for that and genuinely loved him, they were still strangers to each other. The young couple talked on the phone every day, and in the evenings, Lorenza enthusiastically shared with Pancho what he had already seen and known. But he enjoyed listening to her amazed chatter. He liked that she discovered such beauty, and he had rescued her from poverty. In general, he just liked that he was not alone and that a beautiful, kind girl was waiting for him at home. And he desperately wanted to return to her and feel her tender, affectionate embrace. But the desire to put things in order and start afresh was stronger for now. Lorenza, I love you very much, he said, concluding the conversation. When I come back, let's go to one of those cafes you saw today. But for now, I'm going to bed. I have three client meetings tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you, she replied. The big city didn't let her go. She wanted to wander the streets again and again. She even downloaded a guidebook to her phone and listened to interesting stories about the buildings she saw. So, the next day, she went for a walk again. She was strolling along the boulevard, noticing the first buds on the trees and inhaling the aromas wafting from nearby cafes. How wonderful it would be to live in the city center, where there was so much beauty. However, even in Pancho's neighborhood, there were many beautiful houses. But, of course, they couldn't compare to what Lorenzo was seeing now. Unexpectedly, three girls passed her by. One of them, slim and tall, with long black hair, reminded her of Pancho's dream. What an incredible dream he has. And so many months. There must be something to it. Why is he drowning? Who is this black-haired girl? Is it really his father saving him every time? Lorenza really wanted to help her beloved, but she didn't know what to do. She had a leisurely lunch at a cafe, observing the townspeople in cars. The day was heading towards evening, and transparent twilight descended on the facades. She left and walked down the street to the bus stop to go home. Lost in her thoughts, she almost passed by a homeless man who was sitting, leaning against the building wall, when he called out to her. Miss, could you spare some change for coffee? She turned around, hesitated for a moment, but then remembered how she had recently asked for coffee and slept on the street herself. She took change from her pocket and headed towards him. At first, she felt puzzled, but then horror gripped her, and she recoiled. Looking up at her from below was... Pancho. She didn't know what to think or do. The resemblance was so striking that stories about doppelgangers and people leading double lives immediately came to her mind. The thought flashed that when Pancho went to client meetings, he might actually dress up as a homeless person and ask for money from passers-by. Fortunately, before she could try to come up with a coherent explanation for this, Pancho called her via video. Behind him, there was a street from another city. Hello, dear. What happened? Are you okay? He asked, seeing the girl's troubled face. Pancho, Lorenza asked seriously, do you have a brother? What? No, of course not, he replied. Where did you get that idea? The girl flipped the camera on her phone and aimed it at the homeless man. Look, he's your spitting image. Pancho took a closer look inside. Lorenza understood that he didn't believe her. Lorenza, I'm sorry, but I don't have a brother. And I don't have a sister. I only have a mom and you. Stop fooling around, go home. I'll call you later. When he hung up, Lorenza was standing there for a while in confusion, examining the homeless man. Something told her that everything wasn't so simple. Finally, she approached him, lifted her scarf higher to avoid the suffocating Swedish smell of poverty, and asked, How long have you been on the street? The homeless man shrugged. Who knows? It seems like since that year. Where are you from? Don't know. 
What's your name? Don't know. And where do you sleep? In doorways. As long as it's winter, they don't kick me out. She was studying him while asking. By his voice, he was slightly younger than Pancho, but tangled hair, a weather-beaten face long unwashed, and a beard turned him into an old man. The clothing was quite modern, and Lorenza realized that he too had fallen into some kind of trouble. Also, tell me, do you have a brother? No idea, he said, shaking his head. I really don't remember anything, as if my memory got wiped. Lorenza gave him some money and was about to leave when he suddenly said to her, I have some note in my pocket, I just don't know if it's mine or not. Read it, maybe there's something about me written there. And he fumbled with stiff fingers in his pocket, pulling out a lined sheet of paper. Lorenza unfolded it and read, No life, no job, everything's messed up. I can't take it anymore, don't remember me as trouble. See you on the other side. Valerio. Valerio, is that you? I don't know, the homeless man replied. She watched him closely, noting his movements and words. It was clear that he had ended up on the street by accident and had been here for a long time. Listen, Lorenza suddenly said decisively, we're going home now. You'll wash up, change your clothes, and I'll feed you. After that, she hesitated for a moment but continued, my husband will come and we'll figure out your name and what happened. The homeless man tried to stop her, but she hailed a taxi. She had to argue with the driver for a bit. He refused to transport a dirty man who emitted a foul odor. Are you going to pay for cleaning the car? The driver protested, waving his hands. Are you into charity or something? Then buy your own car and drive whoever you want. Lorenza, looking him trustingly in the eyes, put a banknote in his pocket. Please take us home, she asked. I'm sure he's not just a homeless man. He's in a difficult situation. Difficult situation. The driver continued to complain, but eventually allowed them both into the taxi. Now I'll have a difficult situation with my car. How am I going to work later? Nevertheless, he did drive them home. Once there, Lorenza, after sending the stranger to shower, went to seek help from Pablo, who lived on the same floor but on the other side of the elevator. Lorenza, I'm listening attentively, he replied, standing in the doorway. The aroma of just cooked lunch wafted from the kitchen. Pablo, she explained. Today in the city, I met a man. I don't know how old he is, but he looks a lot like Pancho. It can't be. Pablo said, throwing up his hands and rolling his eyes a bit to convey his surprise. It can. I brought him home now. I want him to wait for Pancho. I feel like it's not a coincidence. But I'm afraid to be alone with him. And you want me to stand guard with you? The accountant clarified ironically. Pablo, I'll ask Pancho to come back earlier. Maybe tomorrow. But we can't let this man go either. I'll explain everything to you later, or Pancho will tell you. Not hiding his displeasure, Pablo closed his apartment and followed Lorenza. The stranger had already left the shower, put on Pancho's clothes, and was now sitting bewildered on the couch in the living room. Pablo, glancing at him briefly, looked back at Lorenzo with a puzzled expression. They're like two peas in a pod. That's the point. Lorenza shrugged. You see... Pancho has been having the same nightmare for several months, as if someone is dragging him to the bottom. And this man has a note in his pocket, like a farewell letter. But he doesn't remember anything, neither his name nor where he's from. Interesting, Pablo said thoughtfully. It seems I need to call Pancho. Ask him to come back as soon as possible, exclaimed Lorenza. Yes, not just as soon as possible. He needs to head home like a bullet. He never told me he has a brother. And he told me he doesn't have a brother. You think? I think in cases like this, Pablo nodded towards the man, all possibilities are excluded. If he gets a haircut, you won't be able to tell who the real Pancho is. Having heard the story from Pablo, Pancho did indeed rush home the next day. 
All possible contracts were signed, and postponing a potential return, especially when your doppelganger was in your apartment, was not an option. However, Lorenza felt that he kissed her somewhat dryly. It was clear that he was upset that she had disobeyed him and hadn't left the stranger on the street. But upon entering the apartment, he froze. The other poncho was also staring at him in astonishment. Both were clearly not ready to acknowledge that each of them had found a brother. Even the stranger's beard and long hair couldn't hide the resemblance. Poncho was the first to regain the power of speech. Hi. I'm Poncho. The stranger shook the extended hand and smiled awkwardly. Hi. I don't know who I am. Poncho looked around in bewilderment. Pablo, who also came to observe, explained. He lost his memory. Why? Nobody knows that, Pablo shrugged. Poncho raised his eyes to the ceiling. All the events since November of last year resembled novels he didn't particularly like to read, but for some reason, he became the hero of one of them. Pancho, Lorenza handed him the note. This was in his pocket, but he doesn't remember anything. What are we supposed to do with this? Pancho asked with poorly concealed irritation. I really don't understand anything. First, you're homeless, without money, without documents. Now another one without money, without documents, and even without memory. But not without a head. Pablo tried to lighten the situation. Well, what's next? Pancho smirked. But let's be serious, he continued. What are we going to do? I don't even know which doctor to go to. And he probably doesn't have insurance. What do we do with him? Yes, there is some complexity in this. Pablo said, shaking his head. While waiting for you, I recently went through my contacts because it was clear that we couldn't manage without a doctor. And, you know, I found a familiar psychotherapist. He lives in the north of our city and charges a decent fee, but the results, according to reviews, are very quick. If you agree, I'll give you his number. I think we should also contact the police, Lorenza interjected. They will probably find him in the passport database. First of all, Pancho said with significance, we need to take him to a barbershop. A new detail emerged at the barbershop. The young man had a head injury. While washing his hair, the hairdresser felt a scar. And when they started cutting the tangled hair, they soon discovered the site of impact. On the back of his head, they found a scar about 10 centimeters long. Where did you get this? Pancho asked. I don't remember, the other replied. But it was evident that he was contemplating and trying to remember. And after a while, he did say. I remember, I think I was in the hospital. Something must have happened. I might have fallen. I don't remember anything else. The haircut was finished, and now Pancho could get a good look at his brother. They inherited a high forehead, a large nose, and large lips from their father. The brother had brown hair and green eyes. Let me call you Valerio for now, and not having a name makes it awkward to talk to you, Pancho said, sitting next to him. Do you remember our parents? If we are brothers, our father's name is Melanio. Valerio looked embarrassedly at Pancho and shook his head. No, I don't remember. Then let's go to the police. We'll look for information there. At the police station, Pancho was recognized after he had helped Lorenza restore her documents. But when the chief saw the two brothers at the door, he whistled. Well, where did you find your brother? It wasn't me, Pancho replied briskly. I left for business, and my girlfriend went for a walk. But she saw him on the street, brought him home, and he had amnesia. We went to cut his hair and found a scar on his head, so there must have been an injury. We found this note in his pocket, and he handed the lieutenant a piece of paper. The chief took the paper with displeasure. I found it. How many times have you touched this piece of paper? Probably, the real fingerprints have already worn off. He sighed and leaned back in his chair. No worries, we'll restore it. We'll check his data against the passport database now to see where he's from. While you're at it, find a doctor. They might have stitched up his wound, 
but since he has no documents, they probably let him go. And no one did rehabilitation, so that's why he has memory gaps. In the following weeks, Pancho could barely keep up with work. The doctor recommended by Pablo agreed to come to Pancho's home. He prescribed Valerio physical exercises, which Pancho, Lorenza, and the accountant took turns doing with him. The doctor focused on restoring cognitive functions. Exposure to the streets also left its mark, and memory loss due to a head injury was compounded by depression. Meanwhile, the police identified the young man as Virgilio. He was 32 years old, a graduate of an engineering college, and worked for his father's holding company. His father, Melanio Santos, was involved in cargo transportation. He became a widower seven years ago and remarried two years ago. Nothing could be found about Virgilio's personal life, except that he lived with his father in the same house. Pablo, upon hearing Pancho's address, whistled. A fancy place. Not where presidents live, of course, but still, there's a good amount of money there. This is interesting. It turns out he's an heir. And the father has a second wife. If she's the same age as the father, she might have a child, your brother's peer. And if she's younger, then. In any case, it seems that your brother was a hindrance to this woman. But why think so negatively right away? Pancho objected. What if it's just an accident? Are they looking for him there? Think for yourself. If they were looking for him, there would be a statement registered somewhere with the police. We don't live in the 20th century anymore. We have the internet and everything is digital. They look for someone in one city and find them in another. Since they're not looking, it means someone is fine with his absence. Pablo reasoned convincingly. Pancho pondered. Until his memory returns, he won't go anywhere, that's clear. And when everything becomes okay again, where else would he go? Frankly speaking, the accountant replied, I would think about his father. If they tried to send the boy to the next world, it was clearly to gain full control over the father. And now, imagine that while your brother is recovering, the father might not make it. Pancho pounded the table with his fist. Enough. He said decisively. I'm going. Where to? Pablo asked. To my mother. It's time for a serious conversation. Pancho's mother lived in the neighboring district. In good weather, he sometimes walked to her through the overpass, but today he went by car. He wanted to arrive at her place quickly. She wasn't expecting him and initially complained that she wasn't prepared and didn't bake anything. Meanwhile, she was placing marshmallows and candies on the table. Pancho was surveying the room, sitting at the table. It had seemed small to him for a long time, but now, after all the events, he felt that both he and his mother had outgrown this room and the furniture that had been there for years. The carpet on the wall, the chandelier with glass pendants, and countless trinkets scattered and hung everywhere. His mother resisted renovations, claiming that the wallpaper, glued 15 years ago, was still good. Pancho didn't argue with her, but now he felt uncomfortable here. She poured coffee into the cups. Pancho decided to start with some good news. I have a girlfriend, and we're living together. His mother was slightly surprised. Why didn't both of you come together? I would have liked to meet her. Another time, Mom. I came for a different reason. He glanced at her, but realized that she had no idea about anything. Mom, he began. What do you know about my father? My real father. He emphasized, noticing that his mother was silently staring out the window, not asking anything else. Pancho felt that she didn't want to say anything more, and he remained silent, hoping that his silence would eventually prompt her to share something. I don't know anything about him, she dryly replied. He wanted to focus on business, not family. I thought we could just live together. I agreed. But when I got pregnant with you, I decided to test him. I asked him what would happen if I were pregnant, and he said that marriage would disrupt his plans and gave me a choice, either him or you. She sighed and took a sip of coffee. I chose you and left him. I didn't even tell him that he would have a child. So, 
You never talked about him because of that? Pancho clarified. Yes. Also because he actually became famous and respected, and at some point, I was afraid he might take you away. After all, he had a business and money, and I was just a regular doctor. But I wouldn't have agreed to leave you. Pancho protested. And you knew how hard it was for me, I lived without a father. But it didn't harm you, his mother argued. You grew up strong, reliable, and built your own business. What's wrong with that? Mom, Pancho waved it off. But I also missed my father, even though I never saw him. It turns out, you knew all this, but kept it from me. And why are you interested in it now at the age of 35? His mother asked. Is your girlfriend asking? Because I have a brother. Pancho briefly recounted the entire story to his astonished mother and concluded. That's why I came. I wanted to learn something about my father from you. His mother was sitting pensively, holding the coffee cup in her hands. Then she stood up and went to her room. Pancho was left alone. What he had heard made a strong impression on him. He could understand his father. His former girlfriend had also asked not to rush with marriage and having children. But for himself, he decided that if she became pregnant, they would get married. True, the girl herself was in no hurry to become a mother. And then they broke up, but Pancho knew for sure that she did not have an abortion. And now he was angry with his father. I was angry with that young man who could have prevented Pancho from being born. Because he hadn't yet created his successful business, he hadn't become rich and respected. And the resentment he felt toward his mother was replaced by deep gratitude for her determination and willingness to raise a child alone. He covered his face with his hands. Emotions overwhelmed him. The mother returned to the room with a small green box in her hands. Here, you can see how young we were, she said with a smile. I always kept these photos with him separately so that you wouldn't see them. And also to avoid stirring up memories for myself. There are photos of your father. Pancho opened the box and took out a stack of photographs. Some were taken on film, others on Polaroid. In most of them, the parents were together. His mother looked dazzlingly beautiful at that time, wavy shoulder-length hair, an exquisite figure, and a smile. And next to her was his father, tall, broad-shouldered, with a high forehead, generous lips, and a large nose. There were photos from the beach, from New Year's gatherings, and some domestic pictures. And everywhere, in all the photos, his mother looked so happy. And his father looked at her with such love. Pancho couldn't wrap his head around the idea that this man could suggest to his woman getting rid of their child. But he couldn't disbelieve his mother either. Mom, he asked her, if you met Dad again, would you forgive him? His mother flared up, but restrained herself and turned to the window. Pancho noticed that her face, which she had been holding all this time, smoothed out and softened a bit. I don't know, son, she replied. I don't know. So many years have passed. Probably, it's no longer necessary. I mean, to meet again. But to forgive... I forgave him a long time ago. They were sitting in silence, then his mother started asking about Pancho's brother and suggested, take some photos of Melanio and show them to him. Maybe he'll start remembering. It was a good idea. Pancho chose a photo where the father was alone. He was smiling and standing by a tree. Perhaps Virgilio would indeed remember him. I'll call you and tell you how it went, he promised his mother before leaving. Take care of yourself, she replied. Virgilio did not react immediately to the photo of his father. Following the doctor's recommendation, they put the photo in a prominent place in the room so that he could see it regularly. But his memory was not in a hurry to return. On Saturday, Pancho, Virgilio, and Lorenzo went for a walk. The plan was to visit the shopping center to buy Virgilio some spring shoes. As always on Saturdays, there were many people and young couples walked together to avoid getting lost in the crowd of families with children. Pancho, as usual, supported his brother, who still leaned a bit on his left leg. Suddenly, Virgilio straightened up, his face darkened, and he almost gritted his teeth and rushed forward. 
Pancho followed him and managed to hear Virgilio mutter, You won't escape, witch. And then he saw a female figure in the crowd, of average height, in a red coat. She had long black hair, just like the girl from the dream, and Pancho realized that it meant something to his brother. Meanwhile, Virgilio caught up with the girl, rudely grabbed her shoulder, and turned her to face him. The girl screamed, and Pancho saw a tall, broad-shouldered man approaching her at a furious pace, pushing people aside. Apparently, the girl's husband. It was clear that he had no intention of sorting things out. So Pancho stepped forward decisively. Sir, I will explain everything to you now. What is there to explain? The Georgian shouted loudly with an accent. He grabbed my woman. What for? Get your hands off her. Get your hands off. Virgilio did remove his hand from the girl's shoulder, who clung to her husband in fear. I made a mistake, sorry, he muttered, turning around and looking for Pancho or Lorenzo with his eyes. A mistake. The Georgian persisted. Think twice before doing something. Listen, buddy, Pancho said conciliatorily, don't be angry. My brother lost his memory, and your wife reminded him of someone. Maybe his memory will come back to him. Don't be mad. Meanwhile, Virgilio began to look around helplessly, gasping for air. It's a panic attack, exclaimed Lorenza. Virgilio, breathe deeply. Name five colors you see around you. Leaning against the wall, Virgilio breathed deeply and named them one by one. Blue, gray, white, black, red. And then he shrank, slid down the wall, and burst into tears. Pancho sat next to him. What was it, Virgilio? Through sobs, he made out words like witch, hates, father, to the other side. But there was no coherent narrative. And then Virgilio's gaze brightened, and he grabbed Pancho's hand. They will poison him. Who? Pancho tried to free his fingers, but it wasn't easy. My father. She's a witch. She'll definitely do it. Wait, brother. First home, then we'll figure it out. The doctor had warned that in cases of memory loss, it could return with a subsequent shock. Saturday's incident had the desired effect. Memories overwhelmed Virgilio. It turned out that his parents and he lived in a large, three-story house. He graduated from an engineering college and started working for his father's company, organizing the transportation of heavy cargo. Seven years ago, his mother died, and initially, his father was inconsolable. However, one day at a corporate party with friends, his father met a young brunette. She was only slightly older than Virgilio, and she immediately caught his eye. But his father fell in love with her. Her long black hair could drive anyone crazy. Two years ago, his father and Lucretia got married. Virgilio had no suspicions. Lucretia did genuinely care for his father, who was beaming with happiness. And Virgilio had almost calmed down. But one day, during a meeting in the city, he noticed Lucretia's car from the restaurant window. She parked in front of the house and disappeared into the nearest entrance. When Virgilio stayed a bit longer at the restaurant, hoping to see her again, she didn't rush to come out. So he went home. A month later, his father had business in another city for two weeks. Virgilio had to substitute for him in the office all this time. Every morning, he left early and returned late in the evening. They hardly met with Lucretia during the day, and in the evenings, she watched TV series in the bedroom. One day, Virgilio, having finished all his work, decided to return home earlier, not after 8 in the evening, but around 5. As he approached the house, he noticed an unfamiliar car in the parking lot. Lucretia's friends sometimes came by in their cars, but he saw such a car, the latest model of a BMW sports car, for the first time. An unpleasant premonition rose in his chest. Virgilio entered the house. Romantic music sounded from the second floor, and there was a set table for two in the kitchen with leftovers from lunch. The premonition intensified, and his heart began to beat faster. Going up to the second floor, Virgilio made sure the music was coming from his father's bedroom. 
He wanted to burst into the room, but restrained himself, only slightly opening the door. What he saw horrified him and left no doubt, Lucretia was cheating on his father with someone of Virgilio's age. Pretending to close the door, Virgilio went to his room. He was in shock. Lucretia now evoked deep contempt in him. From his father's colleagues, he had heard not the most pleasant stories about her past life, but his father, experiencing loneliness and wanting to give love another chance, dismissed everything and completely trusted his new wife. Nevertheless, now Virgilio had no doubts about Lucretia's infidelity, and he was ready to take action. When her lover left and Lucretia went to wash the dishes, he went down to the kitchen. So, how was your day? Virgilio calmly asked. She poorly managed to hide her surprise, and when she realized that Virgilio might have found out about her affair, a shadow of fear crossed her face. But she quickly composed herself. Great. Yours? Apparently not as exciting as yours. What do you mean? She asked, continuing to wash the dishes. Is my father not enough for you? Do you want to continue your adventures? It won't happen. She tensed, but replied calmly. Your father won't find out. I will tell him myself. You have no evidence. I recorded a video from the entrance cameras. She continued to silently wash the dishes. How could you, Lucretia? Virgilio continued. My father cares so much about you. He really loves you. But I won't allow you to betray him. Is that why you came to the city? He lives across from the restaurant, right? Were you spying on me? It was hard to tell from her voice what she was feeling. Rather, she wanted to understand what he was plotting. No, I was at a meeting and saw your car. You left it and went into the house. She paused, then said, raising eyes as black as coal. Listen, your father perfectly understands that I'm a young woman. Even if he finds out, he'll forgive. But I won't just leave him, remember that. Even you won't stop me, so don't try. This unequivocal threat surprised Virgilio at the time, but he decided to wait for his father to act. When the father arrived, he dismissed the suggestion to talk. There was too much work. The end of the year was approaching, and there was much to do dealing with logistics. What was there to talk about? Later, Virgilio noticed that his father occasionally felt unwell, his blood pressure rose suddenly, and he increasingly asked Virgilio to go to the office instead of him. Virgilio suggested calling a doctor, but the father waved him off even from that. Meanwhile, Lucretia was pure love and tenderness, spending days by the father's bedside when he felt unwell and not arousing any suspicions. Finally, in November of last year, Virgilio went to the city for business. He had to stop by the office, and he usually wore a suit, but this time he decided to go in jeans, a sweater, and a jacket. The day before, he and his father discussed the details of an upcoming deal, and Virgilio had to prepare some documents. After finishing his tasks, he went to have lunch at a restaurant when Lucretia suddenly called him. She didn't call him often, but given his father's condition, he became worried. Hi. How's dad? Hi. Her voice had playful, kind notes. Daddy's fine. Listen, I'd like to meet with you. What do you say? Why? I want to talk. We have nothing to talk about. Virgilio was about to hang up, but he heard. We need to talk about the inheritance. If something happens to your father, we are the closest relatives. I just suggest discussing and coming to an agreement. Virgilio was outraged. It deeply upset him that his father's young wife, who kept cheating with her young lover, was already preparing to divide the inheritance. Oh, if only he could do something. But his father still knew nothing. However, finding out what Lucretia was planning and what share of the inheritance she wanted to give wouldn't be a bad idea. Let's discuss it, Virgilio agreed. Where should I come? Let's meet by our river, Lucretia suggested. I don't want to leave him now, he's asleep. And outside, in the fresh air, we might come to an agreement. He arrived at the appointed time and saw the familiar sports car again. Virgilio sensed trouble, 
but there was no turning back. He got out of the car and walked towards Lucretia. Her lover was nearby. Now Virgilio could get a better look at him. He was of average height, slightly shorter than Lucretia, with a sporty build, baby-faced, and an unpleasant expression. Good for you that you came, Lucretia said, approaching him with a cigarette in hand. So, what are we going to talk about? Virgilio asked. About us, about you. You are the main heir, after all. I understand that if I ask you to share it with me, you will refuse. And, it seems, I'm nobody, with nothing to my name. I've seen the will, the company goes to you, the house goes to you, and the car goes to you. Irritation was evident in her voice, although she tried to speak calmly. Everything goes to you. But I don't want it that way. And what have you come up with? I thought it would be good if you weren't around. What a fool. Virgilio couldn't hold back. But I'm here. You're here now, Lucretia replied, but in the next moment, you might not be. Virgilio noticed that she flicked the ash, but he couldn't fathom that it was a secret signal and didn't react. The next moment, a heavy blow struck his head, and he lost consciousness. Virgilio vaguely remembered his time in the hospital. Faces of doctors and nurses flashed before his eyes, intravenous drips, hospital food. He remembered the word concussion. Apparently, right after the injury, he lost his memory. He didn't know how much time he spent in the hospital. They told him he was found by dog walkers who frequently walked near the riverbank. They noticed he was well-dressed and had a head injury, found a note in his pocket, and called an ambulance. But before the new year, he was discharged, despite the lack of documents. He remembered nothing. They told him he was in a suburban hospital and hitchhiked to the city. He spent the entire winter here, sleeping in the entryways, until Lorenza found him. I remembered, my name is Virgilio. He exclaimed joyfully. And my father is Melanio. He still looks like a youth, just like in the photos. He became serious. But we lived somewhere else, not where they found me. So, they transported you, explained Pablo. Apparently, they wanted to divert any suspicion completely. Was your clothing still on you? My jeans and sweater were mine, Virgilio recalled. But I guess the jacket wasn't. Then most likely, they used the jacket somehow to create the impression that you were kidnapped or something like that, without the jacket. And they put the note on you. Let me tell you this, Pancho began. Since November, I've had a dream. Someone is pulling me underwater, trying to drown me. I resist or freeze, and then someone's strong hands pull me out, and I hear a faint voice saying, Dad, Dad. I didn't understand anything. Then one day, a girl with long black hair appeared in that dream. I was scared and told Lorenza about it, and she said something like this can happen to people close to you. It's a way to warn of danger. But I didn't know anything about your father or you. And now it's clear they were trying to convey something about you to me. Virgilio was listening attentively but didn't know what to say. My friends, Pablo began. I think we need to discuss how we're going to save your father now. It seems Lucretia won't stop at anything. We need to catch her off guard. I have an idea, Lorenza said. We need to force her to tell the truth. How will you force her? Pancho asked skeptically. There's nowhere to put the lie detector, apparently. That's true. But I'm reminded of Agatha Christie's stories, something like that. The girl responded with enthusiasm. When you know, it seems like you've removed someone, but they appear again with a double. Everyone present exchanged glances. It was a plan. They set out to implement the plan, of course, accompanied by the police. For a couple of days, they'd been watching the house. Lorenza and Pablo found out from neighbors that the brother's father was still alive, but his health was deteriorating. Lucretia's lover almost constantly lived here, and they rarely left the house. Everything was delivered home. They told the father that his son was missing and that the police were looking for him. But as time passed, there were no results. The father was too weak to go to the city himself. So he relied on news from his young wife. 
Hearing from Virgilio and Pancho what had happened, the neighbors agreed to help. It was decided to lure Lucretia's lover out of the house. For this, a neighbor ran to Lucretia, lamenting that she urgently needed to go to the city, but the car's battery died, and the taxi would arrive only in an hour. Lucretia didn't suspect anything bad, although the guy clearly didn't like the idea. Nevertheless, the neighbor got in the sports car, and they drove away. After some time, a delivery arrived, and the chief Gonzalo played the role of the courier. Of course, Lucretia hadn't ordered anything, so she spent the next 15 minutes on the street, finding out the details. And when it was time to make a call from the courier's phone and cancel the order, the phone treacherously ran out of battery. Trusting the courier, Lucretia led him into the house to charge the phone in the hallway. During this time, Pancho and Virgilio climbed over the fence and entered the house through the back entrance. Virgilio went upstairs to his father's room. He was sleeping. The room smelled of medicines. Hang in there, Dad. Everything will be fine, he whispered, and he headed to the kitchen as planned. Lucretia had already returned from the street and was in the kitchen, carrying a plate of pasta to the table. Virgilio descended the stairs towards her. The plate fell to the floor, and Lucretia stared at Virgilio in horror. Where did you come from? I came from the afterlife. How are you managing here without me? Do you want to go there again? Lucretia asked with an icy tone. Wait. Virgilio responded, smiling. Why so harsh right away? Tell me, what's going on with Dad? What are you giving him? He doesn't need anything to be given. He's old and sick. No, you made him like that. Get out of here. Job will come, and for sure, he'll kill you. Just at that moment, Job appeared at the doorstep. Seeing Virgilio, he froze and looked questioningly at Lucretia. Yes, he survived. Can you imagine? Well, he's a psycho. Job replied. Why did you come here again? I'll double check everything this time, for sure. There won't be a second time, he heard a Pablo's voice from the behind. And who are you? Lucretia began to suspect a trap. Me? Pablo clarified. I am the accountant, your dear accountant. Accompanying these young men on a trip to their dear father. What young men? Something was starting to dawn on Job as well. Let me introduce you, Pablo continued. This is Virgilio, you know him. And this is his brother, Pancho. And he gestured for Pancho to come out of hiding. Watching the astonished faces of Lucretia and Job, he added, There is not just one heir here, keep that in mind. Using the diagram drawn by Virgilio, they positioned themselves in the kitchen to prevent Lucretia and Job from escaping. However, Lucretia turned out to be less straightforward. She kept a weapon in the kitchen table drawer, right under the countertop. And now, in an instant, she decisively grabbed the gun and cocked the trigger. I'll kill anyone who takes a step towards me, she warned. A funereal silence hung in the kitchen. No one expected such a turn of events. But then they heard a quiet voice from above. Lucretia, I need you. She struggled with herself for another minute, then dropped the gun and helplessly fell face down on the table, crying. He was so kind to me. So kind. I'll never find someone like him again. Never. What a fool I am, dear God. Job rushed to grab the gun, managed to get hold of it, but hesitated, not understanding which of the brothers to shoot this time. Chief Gonzalo preceded him. Job fell unconscious to the floor, Lucretia screamed in horror, and Pancho grabbed her, twisting her arms behind her back. At that moment, a group of police officers entered the house. Job was seriously injured but survived. The investigation revealed that after he hit Virgilio on the head, he and Lucretia did indeed take off his jacket and arrange everything to make it seem like Virgilio had become a kidnapping victim. They took Virgilio to the neighboring town in the trunk of his car and dumped him by the river. In that place, he could easily roll into the water, but local residents walking their dogs discovered him in time. After the arrest of Lucretia and Job, the brother's father was moved to the hospital. 
He recovered quite fast, and three weeks later, Virgilio invited his brother into the room. The father looked at him intently and then said, Is your mother's name Franca? Yes, Pancho nodded. I remember. We were very happy. He patted Virgilio's hand reconcilingly. That was before you were born. There should be three years between you. She left me in an instant, and I knew nothing more about her. She said, Pancho gathered courage, that you didn't want her to have me. Yes, I was a fool, the father admitted. Although I was joking, in reality. If I had known she was pregnant, I wouldn't have let her go. But she didn't say anything and just left, he sighed. But at least you and Virgilio met. You are friends now, since it turned out that way. Definitely, Dad, Virgilio replied. When the father was discharged from the hospital, he asked Pancho to bring Franca to him after some time. Pancho kept his mother informed about what was happening, but she declined the father's proposal. Son, she explained to him, there are things that are done only once. Your father and I were together once. Well, he hasn't invited you to marry him yet. Pancho smirked. But then he thought that this was probably what his mother had been dreaming of all her life, and he remembered his New Year's wishes. Only one remained unfulfilled. Mom, he said, hugging her by the shoulders. You can't escape fate either. You're not the Lord God, he added in a tone almost like Pablo's. The mother waved her hand then and went to the kitchen to bake a pie. And after a week, when the July leaves were lush green and birds were chirping, someone called her small apartment. She was only expecting her son and swung the door wide open. A scent of roses hit her face, and behind the bouquet, she saw familiar eyes that hadn't changed a bit over the years. Well, the runaway has been found? Melanio smiled. You found her yourself, Franca replied, holding back tears. Give thanks to our son, he saved both his brother and me. You raised a good lad, well done. He embraced her tightly. Life went on its course. Pancho's mother and father moved in together, and they soon got married. Both were happy to find their first love and spend the rest of their time together. Virgilio took over the management of the conglomerate, and Pancho gained access to numerous companies in need of website development. However, news came that his former partner went bankrupt in less than a year of owning the company. Apparently, capitalizing on someone else's misfortune wasn't a sustainable business strategy. Pancho's former clients returned to him, and he founded a full-cycle advertising agency. Accountant Pablo, as planned, hired employees and started advising his colleagues much earlier than he had planned. One morning, Lorenza hugged Pancho by the shoulders and said, I'm so proud of you. You're brave, strong, and enterprising. I owe it to you, he replied. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have found my brother or father. That's exactly what I wanted to say, she hesitated. Let's name our baby after your dad when he's born. Wow. Pancho was taken aback. Well, we need to get married first. And we will. Lorenza smiled. But let's name the boy Melanio. And the girl? Olivia, after my grandmother. Deal, Pancho said, gently holding the future mother close. Bright sunlight flooded the courtyard where the neighborhood children were playing. Pancho marveled at how, in less than a year, all his wishes had come true. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.